But on this side of eternity, before the, the great judgment at the end, where we'll all be judges individuals, he also judges nations as a whole on the national stage. There's a certain level of whether or not we follow him that comes to fruition and, and the proof kind of comes in the pudding on this side of eternity. Because you'll notice even the bad and evil wicked nations that he specifically uses to punish other nations like Babylon, like Assyria, he then turns around and punishes those evil nations too. And so they wind up receiving the fruit that they bore. Hey, fellow tacticians, be sure to like this video and subscribe and ring that little notification bell. That supports this channel's conservative content, which is good for me, good for you, good for America, but really bad for the dark cyber overlords at YouTube. In 1775, the Continental Congress created the Chaplain Corps. Under the command of General George Washington, each soldier was required to attend worship service every Sunday. While other armies advanced on their feet, Washington's troops advanced on their knees. It's time for the Chaplain's Report with Caleb Colquitt on tactics. For our Chaplain's Report today, we're going to be taking a quick break from our series on 1 Samuel to talk about what it means to really be a nation under God. That was kind of the theme of our entire show this day, and, and since it is Independence Day, we're going to talk a little bit about that in our Chaplain's Report as well. The context you really need to understand to really grasp the full gravity of this verse is to understand that this was a psalm by King David. So Psalm 9 is a psalm of David that's actually included in the, uh, the biblical tradition. So King David wrote this, and remember David himself is a king, somebody that had some firsthand knowledge of a kingdom and how it's run and sort of the weight of the crown, that kind of thing. And so when you understand that and when you really comprehend how important that was to him and something that we, he would have had intimate knowledge on, I think that this psalm makes even a little bit more impact. So let's go ahead and look at Psalm 9, verses 15 through 16, where it states, The nations have sunk down into the pit which they have made, in the net which they hid, in their own foot, their own foot has been caught. The Lord has made himself known. He has executed judgment. A wicked one is ensnared in the work of his own hands. So what this verse is talking about is that God does judge nations, but he does it in kind of an indirect way. Because you'll notice that what the passage is talking about there is when God does judge a nation like Israel, like he's doing here, or rather I think this, this verse particularly is talking about God uh, judging other nations, nations that are enemies of Israel. He's saying they've sunk down into the pit which they've made, and the Lord has executed judgment and ensnared them in the work of his own hand. So in other words, what he's saying here is, when countries go awry, when they neglect God, when they ignore his principles, when they oppress the poor, or use their power in evil ways that God wouldn't approve of, what they're actually doing is falling prey to the fruit of their own labor. You see, when they do bad things, the laws of nature, the same laws of nature that are talked about right here in the Declaration of Independence, come back to bite you in the keister. Because nature is set up in such a way that if you make immoral decisions, you will get the reaction from that coming back upon you. And so while God definitely judges nations, I don't think it's always in the way that we think of, you know, we think of, oh, I do something wrong. God's going to send down a lightning bolt to strike me. Well, that's not usually how God punishes. I'm not saying he never does things like that because that happens sometimes in the Old Testament. But usually when something like that happens, it's because God has either taken away his hand of protection. In other words, taken away his protecting you from falling prey to the results of your own decisions or it's because he's the one that set those natural processes in place in the first place. He's the one that directed the laws of nature and created the order. And when you start messing with that order, the order starts messing back. It's not like God is taking an active role here. It's more like the systems that he put in place long ago are starting to react to the way that you have abused and neglected them. It's the same way like uh, if you just ignore the rule of gravity and you jump off a 50-story building, 
gravity doesn't really care that you ignored it or that you don't have any respect for it. You're going to wind up dying either way. Like your faith or your belief in that has no bearing on what happens to you. And the same thing is happening here. He's saying these nations reject you. They have done all these evil things. Well, they're going to get theirs. And it's not even necessarily that God is directly going out of his way to create an event to punish them. It's that they're just going to, by merit of the things that they've done, face the consequences of their actions. It's kind of the Jeff Foxworthy's dad approach. There's an old Jeff Foxworthy routine in the, I think it's the Totally Committed album, where he said, my mom was always terrified, Jeff Foxworthy speaking here, said, my mom was always terrified that something bad was going to happen to us. Like we used to have this giant heavy box TV on top of like a TV tray. And my dad's philosophy was always like, let him drop it on his head a few times. He'll learn. Yeah. You want to stick a penny in the light socket? There you go. Try that out. Boy, that hurt, didn't it? Don't do that again. <laughs> so, um, I mean, it, yeah, it's funny, but sometimes I think God kind of operates like that. Now, unlike the dad in Jeff Foxworthy's story, God does typically send prophets and warnings and that kind of thing to let them know, hey, the time to repent is now. You guys have done something and you've screwed up. So we got to reverse that. But what is being discussed and exemplified here in the psalm is that sometimes God takes the approach of, I'm not going out of my way to cause anything to hurt you. It's just the way that the laws of nature work that they're going to come back and they're going to visit upon you the things that you have done to other people. Like when his dad in this example uh, says, you want, to, you want to stick a penny in a light socket? Go ahead, do it. See, see what happens. God's kind of playing that same role there. It's that they go ahead and they do it. It's not, the dad didn't like turn the outlet on. The dad didn't make electricity shock him. He just let the son kind of play around and experiment himself. And when he made bad decisions, bad things happened to him. And so that's the sort of punishment that is being described in this particular Psalm. And, and we understand this as New Testament Christians better than most because we understand that the wages of all sin are death. That's Romans 6.23. And so uh, that is the, the natural outcome of the decisions that you've made. But this is also true on the national level as well, that if nations as a people do really bad, terrible things, that they're going to create a really bad, terrible nation. And so we can see that play out over the events of all of human history, really. So let's go ahead and look at the next part of this passage in Psalm 9, 17 through 20. The wicked will return to Sheol, all the nations who forget God. For the needy will not always be forgotten, nor the hope of the afflicted perish forever. Arise, Lord, do not let mankind prevail. Let the nations be judged before you. Put them in fear, Lord. Let nations know that they are merely human. This is a verse that terrifies me and i also think needs to be shouted from the rooftops especially in america you hear that this language they will return to sheol because they have forgotten god what is the implication there that they were one not always in sheol which by the way is like the netherworld the place of departed spirits you know you there's several different ways you could use to describe it but anyway it's basically the bad place not even necessarily hell just like a uh, the place of death is the best way to describe it. So if they are going to return to the realm of chaos, return to the, the realm of darkness and the place that is away from God's presence, and it's because they have forgotten God, what does that imply? That at one point they weren't there. That they, they may have been there at one point, but they came into the light and were in God's favor, and they were worshiping and remembering God at one point, but now they are returning to their old ways. As a Christian, these are themes that should seem very, you know, familiar to us, because that's the Christian story, isn't it? That we are all dead and lost in our sins, and we come to know God and have a relationship with him through his son and through the, the blood of his son, Jesus Christ, but we have to also maintain that relationship. It's not that we're working towards our salvation. It's not that we're doing anything that God hasn't already done for us, but we do still have to maintain that relationship in order to re remain in God's good graces and in his favor. Because if we start doing things that are against his will, then we fall back 
into Sheol. We have forgotten God. And that's the same principle that David is describing here. It kind of reminds me of Ben Franklin's speech at the Constitutional Convention where he says, if we believe that even a sparrow can't fall from heaven without him taking notice, do we really believe that an empire can rise without him okaying it? Do we really believe that we can build this without God? If we build it without God, we build in vain. That's what Ben Franklin, one of the least religious founders, said. And that's the same thing. Nations will only be good if they recognize God, acknowledge him, and treat people the way God would want that government to treat their people. And so that's exactly what Ben Franklin is talking about here. So the question, I guess, then becomes, what were these nations doing? Well, in this verse, it talks about them neglecting the needs of those that are poor, neglecting the needy. And that doesn't mean the government. That means the individuals. You see, God does judge on the national scale when we're talking about judging in the affairs of man. He judges us in, as individuals on a personal level. But on this side of eternity, before the, the great judgment at the end, where we'll all be judged as individuals, he also judges nations as a whole on the national stage. There's a certain level of whether or not we follow him that comes to fruition and, and the proof kind of comes in the pudding on this side of eternity. Because you'll notice even the bad and evil wicked nations that he specifically uses to punish other nations like Babylon, like Assyria, he then turns around and punishes those evil nations too. And so they wind up receiving the fruit that they bore. They may be powerful and influential for a little while, but God qu quickly reminds them who is human and who is not. And that's the last part of that psalm where he says, remind them that they are merely human. They are not God. See, this rot, this sort of moral decay, when it happens on a personal and individual level, it manifests itself on the national stage. When people aren't taking care of their neighbors, when they're not caring for the needy, the widows, the orphans, so on and so forth, then on the national stage, that starts to manifest itself. You start seeing the results of that. Because if they're neglecting people morally in that sense, they're probably neglecting a lot of their other morality, like, you know, being honest and uh, working really hard and that kind of thing. And when that stuff starts going awry, then nations start collapsing. And we've seen that throughout history as well. Every single nation in human history that fell believed themselves to be invulnerable. They believed that they couldn't fall. Egypt, Rome, Greece, Assyria, Babylon, the British Empire, all of them, they genuinely believed it can't happen here. And that's why when Americans say that, it scares me. Because I know for a fact, because I've studied history, all of those nations felt exactly the same way. And inevitably, most people don't even know those nations now. Most modern people know Britain, but it's not the empire it used to be. And most of them know Rome. But you get past that, the knowledge of those empires kind of goes by the wayside a lot of times. And so because of that, I think what David is calling for here is a, a big dose of humility for these nations to remember that they're just humans and God is God. And ultimately, they're going to be judged by him. And that's something that America could use a healthy dose of as well, because I it scares me when people say it can't happen here. Oh, yes, it absolutely can. It absolutely can. In fact, it will some days. America will cease to exist. Now, we might last until Judgment Day. We might not last another 24 hours. I don't know. But the point is, America absolutely can collapse. It, it is totally possible that we will just be one more blip on the historical radar. That could happen. I hope it doesn't. I'm going to fight to make sure it doesn't. But it is a reality that that very well could happen. And one day America will be destroyed one way or the other. It will cease to exist somehow. And God may judge us eternally on our own personal sins. And that's the most important judgment. But it's also important for us to remember, too, that since God is going to judge us nationally, we as a nation have to turn back to him. And I don't mean the government, because, again, I'm talking about on the individual level. When the individuals act immorally, the nation suffers. When individuals within the nation act in a moral way that brings glory to God's name, the nation 
prospers. That is the way that it has always worked. It's the way it works today. And so if we are going to, as America, continue to be the greatest nation in all of American history, there's only one way that we can do that. And that is to pray to God for forgiveness and to thank him for the things that he's done for us already and to remember that ultimately, just like David said, we're just human. We're just another human nation. And because of that, if we don't have God at the center of what we do, if we do not build on that foundation, like Ben Franklin said, in a way that glorifies God, then we are building in vain. We might as well be building the Tower of Babel and it's all going to come crashing down on our heads. America is a great country. But if we want to continue to be great, the only way we can do that is with God's help. Stay the course, friends. Hey, thanks for watching this video. If you made it all the way to the end, it must mean you like what you saw and should like and subscribe. That or you were just super bored, wound up here by accident, and were too lazy to turn the video off before now. Now, I hope you're the first type of person, but if you happen to be the second type, doesn't really matter to me. I got a view out of you either way. Huh. Profiting off of the laziness of others. This must be what it feels like to be a Democrat.